Oh, okay. Um, does anyone have any questions? Apparently, I'm leading. Iqbal Anka. Thank, thank you for, for that. Well, probably it's more than one lecture's worth there, so you have to be careful. Uh, I have two uh, questions. One is that some people have suggested that probably there is a difference in conclusions between Qom and Najaf on some of these issues. I don't know if there is any validity on that. It's not Iranian, non-Iranian, it's the madrasa's whole uh, ethos. And the, the second one is that, as you can see that sometimes new <coughs> social surroundings, they seem to shape some of the thinking, yeah? Definitely on the Najasa of Ahlul Kitab and things, it looks like the changing settings. Now, uh, as you know, in Iran, they have now something called a shura e maslehat, where there is a disagreement, then this uh, council, does that, in terms of Shi'i law, make law or is it just expediency? So, uh, on the first point of Qum and Najaf, I, I, there are differences, there are overall differences uh, in, in many different ways. Uh, one of the biggest differences actually is the idea of um, philosophy and how philosophy works between them. There's the Maktab al there, there are lots of these different views in, uh, as to the centrality or, the, um, or how uh, philosophy should be ignored entirely and it's very bad and dangerous and... Um, and, and very different interpretations of how philosophy is. I, I think that's one of the biggest drives or differences between the two. But I think there's also a big difference in terms of the big scholars who are present. Um, the, the, in Qum, to some extent, although perhaps not, not still, but in the early days after Ayatollah Khomeini, a lot of the scholar, not all, a lot of the s scholars were very much um, in his thinking. And a lot of the, the views and the ways that he came about them were quite revolutionary. In fact, his, his usul al-fiqh, I mean, some of the stuff he was saying in terms of um, the, uh, the importance of time and place and context are revolutionary and, and till today would be considered quite out there and different. Um, I, and I think that generally some of the big scholars do shape a lot of what happens. I mean, we saw in the past how um, Sheikh Tosi and around his time, literally nobody said anything. Well, not, that's not. A lot of the people after him were very much in deference to him. I mean, even if you look at Ayatollah Khoui, he looks at the scholar, all the scholars of the past, he's in deference to them, he chooses not to take that final step and make a different ruling. I mean, that very often, I think there is that respect culture that the big, big scholars do, as a whole, have a lot, a big following, and therefore a lot follow, go in that path. But despite that, there is still mass difference of opinion, even, even within Qum and within Najaf. There's big differences of opinion on a number of different issues. Um, Maybe not as far as, and not as different as, for example, Ayatollah Fadla in some regards. But then you see people like Ayatollah Sane. I mean, his views and, and his methodology, actually, in many ways, are fundamentally different, one might argue, to many of the other scholars there on, on many issues. So I think that, yes, there's a difference. I think one of the biggest differences is philosophy. Um, and there are differences between the, those places. But I think it's the big scholars who shape a lot of that. In terms of the, um, in, in Iran, how the Expediency Council works, that's normally... Uh, not on the law, not on the Islamic law, um, uh, this is the Islamic law or not perspective. It's more on the what we should do in this situation context, which is very different. It's not saying that this should be the Islamic law, and they don't, that's not their role to get involved in that, but they will look at things and say, well, is the Islamic law consensus on this so strong that therefore uh, the, the, the ruling of the Majlis can't be used? Like, they can, they can look at that in some way, but their, rule is, their, their, their role is not on the determining of Islamic law, and they won't take any judgment on that in that sense. So, I mean, uh, there are many other questions which can lead from these. Yes. Uh, take the question of smoking, right? Yes. Now, you can say it's undesirable, all kinds of things, fine. Is there any way to make it haram in fiqh? 
to make it haram. If you, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're definitely are ways of making it haram. If you if you choose to use the idea that it's something that has no benefit and definitively will cause you to die if you keep on you if you keep on smoking. If it is a a, a definitive action that leads to death, um, then uh, in 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 one sense, some might argue it's very clear in that because there is nothing to say that it could be okay to do it other than the asl amali, the the practical principles that um, asl bara, the idea that everything's allowed unless you know otherwise. If there is something very clear saying actually this this leads to death, and it is clearly something that is not allowed in that sense, some people would argue it's very clear. Now, um, w we have to be slightly careful with this because what about then saying. Um, eating fatty foods. Um, could that be considered to be in a similar category and treated in the same way? Cl climate change, I think, is harder. Um, although there is a lot of discussion on, on some of these issues within places like home, especially. Um, but when it comes to like eating fatty foods, the, 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 um, the reality is that you have, it's very clear that you're allowed to eat these foods. There's lots of things that will justify eating. So you have something to base on, which is a bit more difficult to then argue otherwise. I think smoking, one might argue it is possible to use it. But again, um, I don't think there there's maybe one or two scholars who've said it's haram, but I don't think, I don't think there's um, many who would go down that path. I, don't, I can't see an easy way to do it without, without breaking um, the structures that we currently have in place. I may be wrong, but... Methodologically, I mean, I think there's only the, the idea of saying this will lead to death. Therefore, we have lots of things saying you shouldn't kill yourself. So don't, don't smoke. But, I mean, I'd have to look into more details to whether there is thing. I think Ayatollah Fadlullah was around that path. I don't know whether he explicitly said it is haram. I think he was saying he was almost there if he didn't say that, though. Haram to start, yeah, but, but new people. yeah, so which is a, which is the principle saying that it's haram, right? It's, there's only saying that there's a, another principle saying that if some if you're addicted, you could it's a necessity question. It's more difficult, but in, in a pure sense, he's saying it's haram. And if he's saying it's haram, that's that's he's probably using that methodology. I haven't read his istidlal, so I'm not sure what his rationale is. I assume it would be similar similar to what I've said. I can't be sure. Though. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. So um, my question is actually not one I think you're going to be able to realistically answer, but more of a discussion, is about um, this issue of uh, zanjir, zani, tatbir. This is a big problem in our community. So um, there was a conference earlier this year at Royal Holloway University, and it was an academic conference, and it was a Shia based conference by the Al-Sadr Al family. So um, one of the speakers was speaking specifically about this issue and brought up this problem, especially amongst our youth, about how d diversified their views are in terms of uh, Zanjir Kamatham, Zanjir Zani. And so um, some of our really senior clerics in this country have been absolutely appalled going to some of the youth centers during the month of Muharram and seeing the young people openly um, doing this kind of action and uh, find it really distasteful and very harmful to the like, view of Islam. The, um, some of the Iraqi uh, organizations especially are speaking about, at an informal level at the moment, are speaking about how about... Um, we don't know whether this is ever going to be realistically possible, but getting the four major marjai from Iraq, uh, Ayatollah Sistani, um, and Ayatollah Bashir al-Najfi, Ayatollah Fayyad, and Ayatollah al-Hakim, get them. Is it ever going to be possible to have them round a table to come to a consensus on issues which are not just physically and psychologically damaging and harmful for our communities, something like this uh, Tatbir and Zanjirzani issue, but it's also um, the vast differences of opinion are also dividing our community and causing feuds and difficulties. It's become very problematic. In addition to the view that we're giving ourselves, you know, as Muslims to the wider community. So this is the question whether they can ever agree upon this and come round a table. So from a methodological perspective, it's, it's really um, quite interesting because 
the, the general principle on all of these things is everything's allowed unless you can prove that it's not, right? So, I, I mean, it's a bit more complicated. Than that, but in, in principle, you have this idea that you can, you're free to do what you need to do unless there's something which says, no, it's haram or that you shouldn't do it. So if that's the basic principle, the question then comes on these issues, um, is there something that can make them haram, right? So what, what type of thing could make it haram? Now, Ayatollah Khomeini's perspective was quite clear, and Ayatollah Khamenei, I believe, as well, um, right now, is that the image of Islam is a very important factor in determining certain issues. Um, it's the maslaha principle, right? It, and it's not a principle that everyone agrees on it. Well, sorry. Everyone might agree on, um, on the importance of it, but its relevance to uh, determining fiqh is actually very much in contention. It's not a clear situation. Because some might argue that um, uh, uh, other things might cause damage to the image of Islam. Does that mean that you should change what Islam is all about on the basis of it? Um, and most people would say no, right? So the question is, how do you det determine that line? Ayatollah Khomeini, because of the Wilayat al fiqh principle and the, the idea of a state and a much broader understanding of how Islam plays a role in, in society, has a very different understanding of this, this principle of maslaha and the idea of... What, what, um, yeah, it wasn't necessarily Muslim, but the, the idea of the, the, the public interest um, and how the, the image of Islam is, 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 is used. My understanding, and I can't be 100% sure, but my understanding is that Ayat al-Sistani, Bashir al-Najafi, Ishaq Riyad, and also Muhammad um, al-Aqim, I doubt, I'm not, I, I, I haven't read all of their works in detail, but my understanding is they wouldn't go down that path of using um, the image of Islam in that way. I, I may be wrong. I want to... So they may use other arguments to say why it might be um, haram, but my understanding would probably mean that they probably wouldn't use that principle. At least my understanding would, would go that far. So the question then comes as to how they can determine that something is haram. Or at the minimum, the, the other argument is saying, can you prove it's mustahab in the first place or even something you should do in the first place? That one is very contentious in and of itself. But to say it's haram... Some scholars have been very clear because of they use this, this, this public interest and, 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 and image of Islam principle. Others won't use that principle and might use other principles such as you shouldn't harm yourself, etc. But the question of not harming yourself is a very, again, contentious one because if you're not actually causing long-term harm to yourself, you're only causing short-term small pain, then is that really something that's not allowed? And if so, where do you draw the line? I mean, you can cause short-term pain to yourself by... Um, doing lots of things by lying out in the sun for no reason. Like there are lots of things that might cause short-term harm to you. So, the, so, so if you short-term harm might not be sufficient for for scholars to say it's haram. So, it, in terms of so that's where Zanjir is. So therefore, the idea of bringing everyone around the table to come to a conclusion, I think, is very difficult when they have methodological differences. And I think the the reality is that um, on most issues, and I think Zanjir is probably an exception. We have to just acknowledge there is a difference of opinion. You can't really do much about it because that's how people work. People, you know, scholars who look at the same narration as we looked at will just come to different conclusions. They might have slightly different methodologies. They just might come to a different conclusion. Really can't do anything about that. You can't say, oh, you know, I don't want you to think like that. No, I mean, that's not how it works. People have different views. If they have different views, they have different views. Now, obviously, there's harm to our communities. Now, on that perspective, that's where things might be different. But even then... From a, from, a, from a fiqh perspective, it's very difficult for them to say, I actually think it's haram. Because um, th their narration, and actually, this is a weak narration, but it's used all the time, saying you should not make something haram which Allah has made halal. You should not make something haram which Allah has made halal. In other words, you should, you know, if Allah has made something halal, don't make it haram. Right? This is a question of unity, so it's actually dividing our community. It's is very. It's, uh, this is a big challenge because so unity is so important. And this is very interesting because what you're talking about in terms of out, what you're look, talking about. This is this is where um, some people have very big differences of opinion. Is that these ideas of unity, for example, are ones which are output oriented in, in terms of we look at what the impact is of the law, and therefore we therefore iterate the law based on the impact and the context in which it's done. That idea of, of thinking about the output and impact of a law is not one that most scholars use directly. Most scholars, their view is, we look at the texts, we look at the, the, the sources of the fiqh, of fiqh, and we come to a conclusion on the basis of what we see. 
It is not based on necessarily the impact it might have. Now, if the impact it might have then, then for example, hits one of these principles of unity, as a whole, I'm not aware of any situation where any of the scholars, and I may be wrong, but I, I'm not aware of, uh, of situations where they change their rule based on this principle of unity. I'm not aware of any example where that's the case. I think like there are some people who would say that it's very important that they do, but I'm not aware that they ever have in any, in any uh, example that I've looked at. And therefore, it would be a fundamental change for them to make such a judgment, and therefore, the ramifications of that change are quite a lot. And it's, you know, the, I've looked into this a little bit and looked at how this output works, but it's a very, an output-oriented approach to fit is not something that is, is, is very prevalent at all within, within the, the Shia school, as far as I'm aware. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my question was, um, is there any school of thought or um, scholars that use positive injunctions over negative injunctions when it comes to contradictions? So save a life, do save a life, rather than don't cut a bone, um, as, as a way of deciding when there are contradictions. I'm not aware of any. I, I don't think that, I've never seen that within the sort of fiqh works that I've read. I'm, I'm, I, Positive, because I'm not aware of anything that, that, that does that, no. Okay, um, my question about the Usuli school and, uh, and um, Akhbari. I, th I think I know that all Maraja is now on Usulis, but is that Akhbari is now Still there is a the school of thought and um, who um, like who represents it now and that's one question and the other if question I've got is um, if we've got that vast um, difference on opinion um, obviously we need to um, follow that would, would that contradict with the idea of um, following the marja, because when you follow the marja, you follow only one opinion, and then you can't really see the different opinions, and and then the idea of al alam as well within that, and okay. who chooses it? Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of usuli and akhbari, the usuli school is basically by far the most prevalent right now. Um, there are still those who believe in an Akhbari perspective till today. I don't think there are many major scholars. I may be wrong, but I, I'm not aware of any major scholars who are that well known. But this is, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, there might be some major scholars who, who think like this, but as a whole, they don't. Um, the vast majority of the ones that we're all aware of will be from an Usuli perspective. It's worth noting that Ayatollah Khoui did a lot of work in almost trying to bridge the gap. In a lot of his works, he tries to show how in, um, in, he, he uses um, uh, Sheikh Yusuf al-Baharani's al hadaiq work. He looks at it quite a lot and he says, look, the, the rationale that he uses is, is very logical and it comes to a conclusion and look, we're not that different. And he, he does a lot in terms of trying to bridge the gap between Akbarism and Usulism in a lot of his works. Um, but in terms of, uh, as a whole, Usulism seems to be everywhere rather than, it, it's by far the most prevalent and I'm not aware of any major Akbari scholars today who have a big following, as far as I'm aware. Um, in terms of your second question about how does this work in terms of following someone? Okay, so there are a few things. Whilst I've been talking quite a lot about difference of opinion, what I'm trying to say is that there are differences of opinion on lots of issues, but obviously on a large number of issues that there is a mainstream view. You know, how to pray, how to fast, how to, like most of these things there is a mainstream view. All I'm saying is that on some of the edges of many of these things, there are very differences, the, the differences of opinion. That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. And um, in terms of following someone and following the, the atlam, so the, the idea of following a marja in this sense is, is mainly a post Sheikh Ansari concept, really. I mean, um, the, way of, the way that we look at mujtahids right now is, is very much in the last 150 odd years where this type of way of, of, of us following a marja and following the most atlam. Oh, the, the atlam on, on these issues is really a relatively new phenomenon in that sense. There's a general principle. You always would want to follow someone who, is, who knows the topic, right? We've, we've just looked at so many examples where if you look at one hadith which says something, 
actually the opposite is the view of many scholars, right? So you can't just look at it yourself. Sometimes you have to be more careful when you just look at scholar, look at hadith or look at Quran. I mean, sometimes it doesn't doesn't work to get a conclusion because you don't have enough of an overall concept. So obviously you want to follow a scholar who who has that overarching understanding. And the more that the, the greater overarching understanding they have, the more likely it is that their view is something that that is going to be um, defensible when all the other arguments are put in front of it. Um, so, I, I mean, the, the principle of following someone who's, a, who's, who's an expert is clearly, you know, well-established and, and understandable. The question of following one person in particular is one that, that many scholars believe is vital because otherwise you have a situation where you're picking and choosing and it's not very clear. Sometimes you have a methodological difference. Let's say, for example, you follow Ayatollah Khomeini or Ayatollah Khamenei right now on, on one issue and you follow Ayatollah Sistani on another issue. It could be that, um, that the methodology that that one uses to get one ruling would would be very different to the methodology that the other scholar used to get a different ruling on a different matter. So by choosing two two rulings, like for example, one on fasting from Ayatollah Khamenei and one on prayers from Ayatollah Sistani, it is possible that you're you're being contradictory in what you're doing because your your methodology the methodology you're using to get one. Uh, for one scholar is very different to the methodology used for another scholar. So, so you could argue very much that you have to be very careful about using um, and choosing different scholars because it doesn't really make sense sometimes. Otherwise, what methodology are you using? Other people will argue very, very understandably that what you have to think about is the methodology which, which appeals to, which makes most sense to, uh, uh, which understands the context in which you're living in. And some people will say, actually, you need to think about the methodology more. But the reality is most people don't know enough about these things and these differences to make any judgment. And you're likely to follow a scholar who other people have said is very, very learned. And the Ahl al-Khibra have said are very learned. So I don't think it's a simple answer to say, you know, you just follow one people, you follow anyone you want. I think it's a, a more complex question. The vast majority of scholars say you should follow one scholar, which for, the most, for most people makes perfect sense. Why? I mean, to go in... If you ask most people, they won't even know the rulings of the scholar that they're supposed to be following. The idea that most people would have the opportunity to choose lots of scholars on different topics, I don't think is a reasonable one. But what you will have is some people who do have that ability to pick and choose a bit better in a, in a more reasonable way. And for those people, perhaps one might argue they're likely to, to have a different view and follow you know, the views of Ayatollah Fadullah, for example, who thinks that you can have this idea of, 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 of choosing um, different scholars on different uh, topics. Um, uh, but but that's not a view that is held by the vast majority of scholars. Thank you very much. Um, I think that uh, as time is moving on, I think we'll end there. Thank you very much, Mikdal Muhammad Wal Muhammad Salawat.